You know, Imelda looked like a freaking queen to the rest of the world because of that dress. So it's like, take that queen dress away from her and <laughs> take it back. <laughs> The Marcoses kind of turned themselves into, you know, the mother and father of the Philippines. That was their whole propaganda, their whole arts and culture kind of agenda was really all about that. So in a lot of ways, in terms of like the artisanal craft of making all of these things, like the stuff that I sell now, like Imelda had her hand in there. She like funded all of these, you know, like all the tribal artisans and got all of this stuff exported all over the world and like you know of course she killed that terno like she owned it so hard and she had all the best designers and hand beaters all over the Philippines working for her like going blind beating her ternos you know and then Pierre Cardin redesigned the barong for Marco so it was like a slim cut looked really sexy you know with the contemporary 70s collar and you know there was some rumors that kind of Imelda was like a little bit of a you know shall we say Nazi about the Terno like she kind of would tell the high society women that no one else could wear the Terno but her so those are rumors but I'm just gonna put it out there so after they were ousted in 86 it was like the death of the traditional Filipino fashion as we knew it like a contemporary kind of ongoing production of our traditional clothes like in India Saris are reinvented every year and there's trends in colors and all that kind of stuff but people still wear that for weddings and for special occasions and every day there's like different versions there's like everyday versions you know it didn't disappear it hasn't disappeared there's been like a trajectory whereas us you know with the Philippines it stopped it's like terrible that a Filipino traditional thing dies with two people that were hated and like who's in office now who's the governor of Ilocos they're right back in there fully influencing the political landscape still I don't think they ever left to be honest and but then we lost our culture do you know Imelda looked like a freaking queen to the rest of the world because of that dress so it's like take that queen dress away from her and <laughs> take it back you know like that's kind of what I was thinking about and trying to do in in creating Vinta. It's like, I want that dress back. I don't want it to be for her. I want it to be mine. I want to wear it. I want to look that good, you know? So it, it was that kind of idea because it's not hers. It's all of ours. <laughs> People need to realize that we are not a homogenous culture there's hundreds of different tribes and each tribe has a very different tradition they have a different language they've just been kind of delegated to being called dialects but they're fully different languages and they're fully different people you know so I think that's what's great about Philippine culture but people don't understand and people don't know that so like I'm always trying to place my reference in a region. The Terno and all that stuff, it is very Luzon centric. But then it was also worn in the south, like if you look at the old pictures in Mindanao, you know, they brought that fashion to that region. But if you're like from a tribe, you're wearing your tribal clothes and regalia and whatever they, they wear traditionally, right? So, and all of that gets mixed into wherever you are in the Philippines. Those are the things like I put that information in and make sure that people know what they're buying. It's not just like, oh, it's like weird tube skirt. It's totally within the context of like, this is what it is. This is the region it comes from. It's worn in many different ways. It's kind of like this weird, precious thing that North Americans or even the diaspora, like the Filipino diaspora, put on 
those cultural products and it's like guys everyone is just trying to make a living they're just trying to put food on the table so if they're artisans and they can make and they have the capacity they have the space to be able to make things that are selling they're gonna make it so you can't like judge anymore it's perpetuating these weaves you know like what are you gonna do just just buy it because <laughs> people want it and it's beautiful so so it's it's a little bit of that kind of thing there, there's there's a, a bit of, of backlash. More often than not, people in the Philippines are living in poverty, whether they're tribal people or not. The urban poor is like astounding over there. And the tribal people, there's a lot of marginalization, there's a lot of injustices and that kind of thing. But it's like when tribal people are entrepreneurs and they're trying to sell their stuff, just buy it. That helps them. But the thing is, it's like, I'm talking to this woman or like several vendors that I have in Manila, like in Quiapo and Divisoria. And they're from Mindanao, they're from Marawi. But I'm getting Ifugao fabric from them, but in different colors. So I'm like, mom, you made this in Marawi. Yes, we make that in Marawi. And I'm like, but this is Ifugao. He's like, yeah, it's Ifugao. But we make it in Marawi because we know that there's a market for it. So like, they're smart. They're like entrepreneurs. They're like, okay, we know all the different kinds of weaves from all over. But since our weaving infrastructure is here and we can make it happen, let's just make all of it. But it was cool that she was transparent with me and she's like, we're from Mindanao, Marawi, this is Ifugao fabric, but we're making it because you're gonna buy it. I'm like, yes, I am gonna buy it.